Hi, I'm Dan Blatz, and welcome back to In Light of the Gospel. Today I'm talking to a man that I do not yet know. His name is Adam Barber. I was first introduced to him on The Door, Michael Pearl's uh, YouTube channel and ministry that he has in Lobelville, Tennessee. Michael Pearl spoke to him briefly, and I thought that the uh, conversation was very interesting, and his history, his story is very interesting. So today I get the privilege of getting to know him a bit. He started a YouTube channel, he has uh, Facebook, he has Instagram, I believe. I know for sure he has TikTok. And some of his videos are getting a lot of views. And uh, most importantly is he's speaking truth. He's speaking the, the gospel of Christ. Uh, he came from a very rough background, from what I understand. Uh, drug use and abuse. And uh, was completely set free from it. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing his story. Thanks for coming along for the ride. I appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel. And um, just share your review. Share your uh, response. If you're getting a, a value out of it, if you're getting a blessing from it, then let me know or share it with someone else who uh, you think could benefit from it. Thanks again. God bless you. Uh, I just want to kind of introduce myself. I'm sure you've seen a few of my videos, but uh, born and raised a Mennonite guy and um, came out of the old colony system, old colony Mennonite system. They're very common here in Ontario, some across Canada, but a lot of them in Mexico. So kind of strange. My great grandparents moved from, from uh, Russia and Prussia and different places in Europe, and then they moved to Canada. My grandparents were born in Manitoba, Canada. And then when the government started getting too involved with their education and such, they moved their families down to Mexico. And so there was a lot of Mexican Mennonites a lot of colonies down there and, uh, and then my parents for better opportunities for work and whatnot they moved back up to Canada and so I was born and raised here in Ontario Canada and attended the old colonies it's when I say old colony people think old order or maybe Amish or something but it was nothing like that I went to public school I wore normal clothes and we, we had electricity and drove cars and all that kind of stuff right so okay but uh, got saved at about 21 years old we had just had our first baby and uh, yeah, I mean, it just drastically transformed everything about the way I viewed God for sure. And then how I did life. I got really zealous, maybe uh, to the point of irritation for some people, my <laughs> wife included. And so we went through some really rough spots. We, I got uh, to train up a child just before we got saved. And uh, that really made quite an impact on how I viewed children and what my responsibilities were as a dad. Um, and then I don't know if you know charity ministries. They were really big out of Pennsylvania. They ministered mostly to Amish and Mennonite type of people. I haven't heard of them. No. So a guy named Moe Stoltzfus and uh, Denny Keniston, uh, very, very, quite popular preachers. Anyway, I got saved through some of their type of ministry. And then a few years into my Christian life, I started getting really religious again, very uh, outward oriented, looking at uh, externals and trying to get my wife to dress more plain more Amish like and you know wear the big long head veil and whatnot and and then I got a hold of Mike Pearl stuff uh, free uh, sin no more was the first series I got and it was just like the gospel all over again right like I had heard it understood it but now to hear it and see it in a way where it was it's not only for justification but it is for here and now my day-to-day -day. it freed me from the grip of these little secret sins and the things that i couldn't really seem to overcome right so um and since then we've had a bunch more kids and not a bunch more we have we have seven our oldest now is 19 so i was saved about 19 years ago and um, she was five months old when i got saved so a lot has transpired since then but uh this uh, this whole video thing has been pretty fun. I mean, fun is maybe the wrong word, but it is. It's it's enjoyable for me to do and reaching into different people's lives and seeing more people affected by it and then getting introduced to folks like you. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> where uh, are you from Tennessee originally? I am uh, most of my. Well, I don't know how far back my family tree goes. I mean, I have uh, you know, people from all over my, actually my great grandmother, she would have been from Germany. That's my great grandfather. He met her or maybe it was grandfather. I don't even know how far back that goes, but he met her when he was in the service over there and she came back over here and she was a, uh, what was described to me as a, a very German lady in the middle of Tennessee, but she was maybe six foot two. Uh, her name was 
Elga, and she was uh, just very broad-shouldered. And, uh, but I, and I never got to meet her because she died right before I was born. Uh, and, you know, we just kind of, the rest of the family is just kind of pieced together from like kind of a patchwork quilt. But yeah, so we've always been right here in the middle of Tennessee. Okay. Uh, we've been down to Tennessee on multiple occasions. First of all, for our honeymoon, we went to Pigeon Forge, um, okay. Severville and all that, right? But uh, we, I don't know, do you know Tremaine, Tremaine Ware? Uh, I've read about him and I've seen different posts going through about him, but I guess that was before I ever got there. Right, right. So we, we met him many years ago. Mike put out an ad saying that he was looking for preaching gigs and that he was a very you know, excellent child trainer and good preacher and stuff. And uh, we invited him up to come into Canada and he couldn't cross the border because of uh, his previous convictions and stuff like that. Uh, okay. Being a former criminal, right, had spent some years incarcerated. And uh, anyway, we met him multiple times and then we tra traveled down to Tennessee and stayed at their house a couple times and been to no greater joy on a couple occasions. and. Uh, toured the the old facility when it was quite a bit smaller still and Tremaine worked there at the time and uh yeah so that I mean that goes way back already too is probably 12 or 13 years ago or something like that okay so let's uh maybe get into a bit of your history then if you were raised in middle Tennessee what would your uh your heritage like have been like or your family history okay when I start droning on you'll have to cut me off because sure. I'll just uh, so, uh, I think that my family life was fairly normal. Uh, my both sides of my family were oneness Pentecostal, so from the UPCI, uh, very strict, and of course they have uh, a lot of different views when it comes to the Godhead and uh, soteria, you know how you're saved and, and all these different things. But it wasn't unique or um, strange to me because that's what I grew up in, and right. my mother, father, grandfather, everyone was uh, in that. Uh, so uh, life was, I mean, fairly normal up until I guess I was about three or four years old and my parents divorced. And that was, yeah, I'm not that old. I mean, I'm 43, but uh, even then divorce was not nearly as common as it is today. So, but it was a small town and it was sort of an uproar. And then we start all of the going back and forth where you have visitation with one parent and visit in custody with this. And it was just very hectic, but like a lot of things, once you do it long enough, it just becomes normal. You don't think that it's uh, strange. Uh, so we you know, managed to, I guess, just, you know, get used to that sort of life. Then, and it was still fairly normal and fairly, um, fairly quiet. And, uh, and so then around my, I was in second or third grade. My mother married a local doctor from uh, the big city of Lobaville, which is about, well, you probably know if you get down to no greater joy. There's I, got your, I got your joke. Lobaville's pretty small, eh? <laughs> yes. And so then, uh, of course, life changed quite a bit because I mean, he was uh, much more well-to-do. And oddly enough, he was from a Seventh-day Adventist family. So I've uh, got all these unique uh, religious <laughs> influences in my life. Uh, but uh, I didn't, I was fairly well cared for. I mean, I certainly had everything that I would want as a child. I mean, I had a, I know so many people that have been drug addicts and alcoholics. They tell stories of abuse and neglect, mm -hmm. and I didn't have that. I had quite the opposite, everything that I could possibly want. And so I, I lived in that. I lived in this uh the lap of luxury, basically, just having everything handed to me. And uh, I'll kind of go into, this is the part of the story that I talked the most about because it's what's so fresh with me. Uh, when I started getting into drugs and alcohol and things that would just change the way that I feel, it actually wasn't substances that I really got into first. I started getting into uh, perversion and pornography. And mm. I think I was the first time I ever looked at uh, any sort of magazine that was pornography, I was maybe 10 or 11. And of course, all of my guy friends are there. And it's something you know, like a badge of honor. Almost everybody thinks you're really cool. You know, you're hiding from everyone. And so we, but that was normal. We didn't really think of anything of it, that it was a big deal. And that quickly see everything that I've gotten involved in my life, it quickly escalates either for good or for bad. <laughs> and so by the time I was 14, I was sexually active. 
mm. which is, you know, having children that age now, that just horrifies me. But again, at the time, I thought that was normal. That was fine. And I, that was, I used the sex and perversion like you would use a drug, which is I couldn't get enough of it. And I was always thinking about it, always talking about it, always seeking after it. And so that's how my high school years went, was this cycle of well, sex and intrigue and all of this drama until I reached my senior year. Now, most people, in, at least here in Tennessee, in small towns, they start drinking fairly young, uh, maybe you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. But I was a late bloomer. I didn't start drinking until I was about 18. And within six months of my first drink, Dan, I was taking heavy narcotics. It's just so in, any in the same way I'm that in, you, you got hooked on something, you just go all in, eh? Right. It's, you know, if one of these feels good, I'm sure that 10 of them is going to be so much better. That's sort of mm -hmm. the mentality that I do. And so, I, you know, I was taking these heavy narcotics like pills and, and uh, different painkillers. And within just a few months of that, I was using um, IV drugs, you know, in, using uh, intravenous uh, heroin, methamphetamine, all of those. Wow. And so it been so quick. But again, that's who I surrounded myself with. So it was it was just life. It wasn't something that was really aberrant or unusual because, hey, all my friends were. And it wasn't even so much that you were looking to hide something or to contain something or numb something even it was just it's what everybody's doing and if they're going to do it i'm going to do more of it or what do you think drove you to that well you know i didn't really understand that at the time but you know now looking back on it you kind of see i've always been a person that i felt really out of place uh, okay. if i was in a room full of a hundred people i felt like i was by myself i just didn't have that sort of connection with people and when i used uh, either alcohol or drugs i felt i felt normal if that's mm. i can't really describe it better i felt at ease it was that's why they, i think they call alcohol liquid courage because that's yeah. what it was yeah. uh, for me just kind of a social lubricant uh so but it, and i think really think that's what led me to do those things in the first place that i just felt so uncomfortable in my own skin that I had, I would just run to anything that would make me feel different, make me feel mm -hmm. okay. And why, when I found something that felt good, you know, I would do more of it and look for something that was bigger and better, and I, I would see. always find it. So, if you don't mind me asking, because most of our audience, my audience here, is is very religious, grew up very Mennonite in most cases. You said you had the Holiness Pentecostal influence from when you were very young, and now the Seventh Day Adventist. Was that was that were you like completely shunned by family for your reckless living and for your drugs and narcotics and all that kind of stuff? Or was it just not you were you not a very religious family at this point? Uh, my immediate family, like my mother and stepfather, they weren't very religious. Now, my grandmother still was and still is. She's still alive. Now, the family in Lewis County, they were more religious to family full of well, pastors and preachers. But even they didn't really shun me. I mean, of course, they wanted me to get better, and they right. still love me. And when usually, if you've never really been exposed to a relative that's into drugs and alcohol, it's it seems like it's crazy to say, but you don't really notice. Even if it's your child or it's your brother, sometimes a spouse, you're you're so used to people, you don't really pick up on it mm. while it's going on. Interesting. And so they didn't really they didn't really know until they started to find out. And then even then you kind of minimize it and say, well, it's not really that bad. He's just he's just a teenager. He's experimenting. People didn't make too big of a deal out of it until bad things started to happen. I see. And this just kind of kept going on and on. I mean, I, I have a friend and maybe you saw the interview. I'm not sure he uh, he got onto meth. And he said with just mm -hmm. one dose, whatever he took it with, I forget now if it was a, if it was smoking or if it was an injection or whatever, I'm just unfamiliar with that. But he said it just one time and he could not stop. That was his, it was now his life, right? Mm -hmm. I'd say that is completely accurate. Really? Uh, not so that it was just one thing, but it was just the, the idea of having anything. I always had to have something uh, mm -hmm. in my body. I feel different. Um, but 
like I said, I didn't have a whole lot of trouble from family where they really made a big deal out of it until it became a very, very big deal because I started getting in legal trouble uh, for small things at first, like the possession, uh, maybe some pills or marijuana or speeding or driving without my license with me or paraphernalia, uh, which are usually somewhat small charges. But being as I'm from the, the doctor's family yeah. in this little small town, it was swept under the rug. And, uh, you know, a lot of times what we do, and I know you said you've probably got uh, members of your audience that are experiencing similar things. Uh, we want to help. We want to help our, our, our children and our brothers when they're going through addiction. So what we do is we kind of cushion the blow for them from consequences. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. Get the legal stuff taken care of. And if you blow all of your money, we'll help you. And see what that what that does is it kind of emboldens you to keep going because there's no real concept for it. And that that was the case for me. Almost like it was enabling you to just continue on, like rewarding you almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was no real consequence for that behavior. And when I say that, it's not that anyone, no one would have thought they were doing any harm because right. it comes from a place of you're wanting to help, right? what you're yeah. doing to help the party. Yeah, I don't think my friend will mind me sharing, but uh, the younger brother who I am more uh, familiar with, he was constantly trying to hold, help his older brother out. Like they would um, bail him out of jail, you know, a couple thousand bucks here or there and just kind of try to help him feed his family and, and hoping to keep his family together and whatnot. But the guy who was on meth, he, he had four, I believe four children at the time already. And it was just going downhill. He's dumpster diving and all kinds of like, that's what his life was. Just anything to get the next payment so he could buy some more. And uh, then he would get into jail too. And they'd have to bail him out. And it just kind of kept doing this for him. And eventually my, my friend who was the younger brother, he just said, that's it. I'm through with this guy. I have no hope for him. And he's constantly lying. He's constantly cheating. And I could see by this point, like our church kind of stepped in and tried to help him. One of our elders was meeting with him really regularly and he would have moments of clarity where he'd be like, I really, really need to get off this stuff. I see it's ruining my family. But then he would say whatever it took to make us convinced that we, he was looking for a way out, that he was trying to help or trying to do something better. And it was almost like you could see already he was completely trapped. He could say whatever he wanted to say. Like, I mean, it was Romans chapter seven on steroids because the things he wanted to do, you knew he had no choice. He could not do what he wanted to do, right? Yeah, that sounds eerily familiar. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So this was all through your teenage years into your 20s as well, or? Uh, so actually, so uh, started drinking around 18 or 19. And, you know, we talked about how that progressed. Uh, once I really started using the IV drugs, that's when this cycle started of uh, going to rehabs, uh, going to jail, getting bailed out of jail. And then I would clean up because everyone, well, they would threaten to cut me off financially, which is what they really should have done in the first place, but it didn't happen. Um, and I would I would get sober. Uh, just like you said about your friend, you tell people what they want to hear mm-hmm. and people so eager for you to get better, they'll, they'll look for anything to believe. And then I would go right back to the same thing I'd been doing. And my legal trouble got more and more. Uh, what was just like a possession charge or a speeding ticket or it turned into DUIs. And uh, finally, I had several theft charges that were swept under the rug. <laughs> mm. I I had been stealing things like checks and money and jewelry, just about everything. Uh, but that was that was kind of pushed aside, and I was able to get out of it that way until uh, when I was, this would have been about seven years ago, I'm 43 now, so this would have been seven, eight years ago, my mother died. Okay. And she was, uh, well, she was, we were best friends, my mother and I. Uh, my mother was also my greatest enabler because moms want their boys <laughs> to do well and to be okay. Yeah. And so once she was gone, I really lost that financial piece there where someone was really making everything okay for me, paying my bills and uh, storing up my responsibilities. And I quickly got in major trouble after that. And this is, uh, this is what ended up being a theft charge, a theft charge that was a felony. And I had no one to bail me out of that. I had no one to 
make it go away. So I had to actually go to jail and stay there for the first time. I stayed for two weeks okay. and I came out, which is not really that long, but it was at the time. I came out completely reformed. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. Hmm. Uh, I did really well for about a month and a half. A month and a half. So two weeks in jail and another mm -hmm. month and a half out of jail. So it almost brought probably around two months of being sober and cleaned up. Mm -hmm. What what was the reform? Just sheer willpower? Uh, yes, it was that. And plus, I had everyone sort of watching me uh, to make sure that I didn't run off. And uh, it was, you know, looking back on it, it's so... I don't know what the right word is that I can't imagine that I was okay with this at the time. It was basically kept like under lock and key where people watch where you go. They watch who you call on the phone. Uh, but you just, you just accept that as normal. This is the price I have to pay for things that I've done, but to be, you know, in your thirties and watched <laughs> and watched like a, like a small child is, is uh, it's not the way that men are supposed to live. Right. Certainly. But, Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty low spot to be in. This, this is now your seven years ago, roughly, when your mom died? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I kind of meant, didn't mention that earlier. I had two children at this point. I had never been married, but I did have two girls with the same woman. And one of them is now, she's 18, the other is 12. So they were uh, spaced apart pretty well. Uh, but after my mother had died and I started getting into major trouble, I completely lost custody of them, where visitation, everything. I had a, actually a restraining order, which was no contact for several months. Then that led up to just four hours every other week, supervised visits. That was all that I could see them. Oh, uh, but again, I, was, I, just, uh, I just took it as, hey, this is what I have to do. Uh, it was an extremely low point. It's, it can't even imagine. I can't even imagine that that was me. That that was my thought process. Looking back, and there's so many things I could tell you. There's these horror stories that so many people have, um, and you know I don't want to take the whole rest of your evening, but I will tell you some of the worst because I like to tell people some of the worst things so they know how bad it was. Yeah, uh, like uh, just to to fill in here quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I was raised to be a good boy. You know, I went to church, re re prayed my prayers and read the Bible. And if you were to look and kind of assess the general Mennonite population of our type, you would say most people are hardworking and stable and, you know, dedicated. They end up getting married and staying married and they have kids and all that. And so you would almost think that the community is somewhat stable. But in the Mennonite groups, especially the ones in Mexico, but Canada is definitely not exempt, drug use is still a serious serious issue drug smuggling in and out of mexico and then a lot a lot of young people are toying with alcohol for sure and then marijuana seems to be a, a bit of a gateway for some people anyway and then uh, there's a select few people so there's plenty of people who uh who are listening who will be listening who have friends and family who are completely addicted and are doing these very things that you're talking about today so it's, uh, it's going to be very relevant for you to talk about some of the worst things that maybe happened during that time. Well, I mentioned that my felony charge was theft. Uh, what I didn't mention is who that theft was from. Now, I was uh, not only a liar, but a stone cold thief, but I was also a coward. So I wasn't strong arm robbing people at random. I was stealing from my family, the very people that were taking care of me and making sure that I had food and clothes, that's who I stole from. Uh, even uh, after, of course, my mother died, it was even my grandmother, who is now 85 years old. So I'm stealing from this woman that's basically keeping me like an errant puppy in the back room, and I'm still stealing from her. Right. And I think the lowest, the two lowest points of all of my theft, I stole my mother's wedding ring, her wedding ring. Um, now, this is when she was still alive, and she forgave me as much as she could. She never let on like she held it against me, but I still remember that. That's uh, that's what I call a Romans 8-1 moment where I have to remember there is therefore now no condemnation because yeah. I still remember it. It's still terrible. Yeah, I can only imagine. And, and then you, that, you ended up selling them, obviously. 
Yes, yes. And I also stole, um, and this was, like I said, my second worst, if there is a first and second, they both are tied, I think, for the head, uh, from my own daughters, my own children. Uh, they had, you know, piggy banks and quarters saved up, and I took those. Um, not even for large amounts of drugs, but just a little bit, just to get through the day and to go buy my cigarettes. Amazing. Everyone, everyone in the world existed in order to get me what I wanted. It, and it's, what's, it's, it's awesome. what's the thought process like at that time? Can you even think about it now? Because now you have a clear conscience and you, you're ashamed of the things you were doing then. Was there any guilt or shame or recognizing that this is really bad or was it more just... I, this is what I need to do to get my fix. Uh, that's what it progressed to. I think it's what happens just like it, it, the way it happens with addiction is be start out small and it's like a slow boil. Just little by little, you are going up to bigger and better things. And by the time you get there, your conscience is already seared. So I had uh, some guilt and remorse, but not enough to make the stop. It was more of, I need this. I'm physically sick. This is here and it will work. Mm -hmm. Consequences, who cares what the consequences are? Unbelievable. Where you're, you're, you're no longer running your own life, right? You're, it's something else is controlling you. Again, Romans yeah. chapter 7, uh, the, there's another law that works in me, the, the law of sin and death, and I cannot do those things that I would, right? Mm -hmm. And it, that's just exactly what it's like where you're a prisoner in your own mind and your own body most if you're addicted to things like i was using like the painkillers and the methamphetamine you have all of these physical symptoms to where for the most part you're not getting high anymore you're just taking something to make you not sick really? and to fun and it's just a horrible uh, little hamster wheel that you're on you wake up steal run get drugs so you're not sick and those wear off and then you're doing it again just over and over and over again my son, actually, he's 15 years old. We were, I forget who we were talking to or what we were talking about. It was about drug use. Um, yeah, I can't remember the details, but he said, why do they do it? And I said, well, I mean, I think it gives them a high. It makes them feel good. It makes them help to, to forget their struggles or their troubles. You know, alcohol will kind of numb your senses and, you know, uh, marijuana apparently just calms you down and mellows you out. But you're talking about originally it was a high. After many years, it was just pretty much to avoid the symptoms of pain and suffering. Yes. Wow. You, when you get to that point and you don't have them, it's just there's a, this sense of impending doom. If you've ever been one of the, in one of these very fearful situations where you're fearing for your life or for a family member, it's that level of anxiety and fear that is just gnawing at you. So it's just it's just a constant struggle and um almost like it's almost like being really physically sick that you can never get rid of wow so yeah, i can that sounds like torment like you would do anything to get out of it mm -hmm. i think torment is probably the best word i should have thought of that one that's the best way to describe it torment yeah i mean that that word torment is used by uh the rich man when he calls out to, to Abraham to send Lazarus. I'm in torment in this flame. I just have to escape. I have to get out. Now, maybe maybe it's wrong to compare to the fires of hell. I don't know. But that sure does sound like a, a very similar type of misery, right? Where there's no escaping. And I told you I had a family full of pastors and preachers. And I remember hearing this sermon. And of course, I was well into addiction at this point. And my great uncle was preaching and he said he was talking about hell and describing the horrors of hell. And he said uh, dope addicts would be crawling around on the floor with a syringe and they couldn't get drugs. And that mental image just burned in my mind, not enough to make me stop. But that right. just that sort of torment would made so, so much sense to me at that point, having you know felt what I was feeling. Unbelievable. So, man, that's, a, that's pretty heavy stuff to, to even just kind of consider to let myself into all the things that I've escaped somehow by the grace of God. Um, what I've heard other people say, like my friend who got out of meth and has been clear for a year and a half or more now and, and living in victory and reading his Bible constantly, sharing the gospel with people, just really excited about the gospel all the time. Uh, I told, told someone else that he was free and this person was familiar with meth addicts 
And he said, well, you just better keep watching him because meth addicts don't get free. And mm -hmm. this person, I don't remember if they were Christian or not, but he was just like, from his experience, meth addicts, they go back to meth. Um, what would have ever gotten you out of this mess, right? To me, apart from a, a com clear intervention, I don't know what would ever snap someone out of it. Well, I remember praying because I at least knew about God. I, I thought I would have told somebody that I was saved <laughs> mm. because I grew up in church. Therefore, I'm saved. Everyone else in my family is. Uh, but I remember I would pray, you know, just you know, God do something, get me out of this. I would always pray when I got in trouble. But I mean, even when I wasn't in trouble, I would be praying for relief. And I had several family members that were as well, that they were praying for me to get sober, for something to happen. And uh, God answered. And the way that he answered was I had a probation officer that, and I'm in, et eternally indebted to this man. His name is Jamie Norman, uh, because he used to hunt terrorists in Afghanistan when he was in the service. So he's not, you can't really get over on him if you're just a you know, drug addict from a small town. Uh, but I... Uh, kept failing my drug screens and so what he did is he put me in jail he let me go a couple times you know with the promise that i was going to get help but i never did so he put me in jail mm -hmm. and that was the answer to my prayer you know so if you're if you're asking god to do something be specific because sometimes he may do something that you really wouldn't want and that's when i got saved when i was in jail that time okay yeah, typically people, you know, there's that uh, kind of that cliche statement where if you ask God for patience, you know, don't expect just a package. It's you're going to get trials, right? It's trials mm -hmm. come when you ask for patience. So that's that's amazing that God would use something like that to finally, obviously, when you're in jail, you have to be sober. You get cleaned up and then your mind slowly gets cleared. I'm sure there was withdrawal and all that kind of stuff. eh? Yes, yes, there was. And, and you know, withdrawal is bad anyway. And it's even worse when you're laying on a floor and a cold jail with 30 other men wandering around. Uh, so I don't know that there's any good withdrawal, but that one was pretty bad. Wow. And how long were you in jail that time? Uh, I was in jail about a month before I got saved. Uh, okay. And even when, once I sobered up, I was still kind of getting into the um, jail life. You get used to that too. Like you do anything, you know, get up, eat, and you get used to the same people. And while I was going through the, the jail routine of waking up, eating, playing cards, reading uh, the mystery novels and all of the different things I could find in there. Uh, one day I could really just feel like uh, walls closing in is the best way I can describe it. It just felt like there was an incredible weight where I was scared for one that I wasn't going to get out of there because that's the longest I'd ever been in jail. And the other thing is I was afraid that I was going to get out because I knew mm -hmm. what I would do. I had drugs at home at the time i knew what i would do and so i couldn't i was afraid to stay and i was afraid to go and i was just coming apart at the seams and i started i remember i was i was praying and i was thinking and i remember believing and i, I remember believing that you know god really can save me and i'm worth saving and, and he really can do that and i don't think it up to that point that i ever thought that god not that I didn't think he was capable. I just didn't think he was willing to do it, if that mm. makes any sense. Like, he was kind of done with me. But I remember believing that. And it's like, you know, I think uh, I think he will. I think he will do it. I think he'll do it. So you, you were thinking that one day he will, or at that moment you already were accepting that he was doing it? Uh, at, at that moment, I just believed mm. that he would, that he could and that he would. Okay. And that, it. I just didn't know what it was going to look like. You know, I've got all this uh, background from different churches and what they tell me it's going to look like. And I've read all these spiritual experiences of what uh, salvation is like for people. And I didn't have any of that. Basically, what I did is I went to sleep after that. <laughs> I was able to. You were reading the Bible when you came to this realization or just in prayer considering God? Uh, it was just in prayer. I mean, I hadn't I hadn't been reading the Bible at this point. It was just uh, you know, different mystery crime novels and everything. And so I was really just in prayer and thinking. Mm -hmm. And so after that, it was that's when I could really tell that something had happened. 
you know, salvation is not a, a feeling that you have, but sometimes you feel the difference in your life. And yeah. we had a uh, church call uh, three times, actually three times some week in, in the jail. And I started to go. I started going to group Bible studies that we had in the pod. I started reading the Bible. And it was funny. I'd been in church my whole life. I had all these people in my family that were pastors and preachers. And that's the first time that I ever sat down and read it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing when you when people have told you what God is like what God's will is for your life. And they, and they tell you all of these things, but it's a whole nother thing to read it for yourself. And, you know, to that personal, you know, the best way I could, that personal relationship that you can't get just hearing about somebody, you have to know it for yourself. I see. So uh, the, was the preaching significant to you at the time, the people who were coming in to minister? Uh, it was actually, there was uh, a couple of people that I, I'd say it was very helpful I mean, I know that when I started going, I was I was already saved at that point. So it felt like you're just really being equipped and taught deeper things that I never really heard before, having never paid attention up to this point. Interesting. It reminds me of the story. I think it's in the early in the book of Mark when the leper comes to Jesus and says, I know that thou canst make me whole, you know, pretty much if you want to, I know you can do this. Um, will you more or less and jesus says i will right so that's uh, that's an interesting perspective because that's that is really coming to god in faith saying i know you can do this and for you to find in your misery in your sorry state you know in your brokenness and having made a mess of your life and well into your 30s now for you to come to god it, when you really think about it, it that's a lot of guts or it's a lot of faith you know who who do you think you are to be able to come to him and say i know you're going to save me but there must have been enough of the understanding of the gospel and the cross and the blood of Jesus somewhere to, you know, uh, put together enough uh, of a cohesive thought where you could say, this is who God is. I know he can forgive. Yeah. And uh, you've probably heard the term jailhouse religion. I've heard that a lot, too. They, yeah. of course they, uh, but it was more than it was more than that, that I was just praying and I was seeking God to get out of jail or to get out of trouble. I, I didn't want to go back to my old life. I mean, that's what I wanted. I actually had resigned in my mind that I might stay here. I might have to do my full sentence, which it was five years. I might I might have to be here for five years. But even if I don't, I don't want to be who I used to be. Right. You know, I wanted him to to rescue me from. That's awesome. Yeah, this this friend of ours, he we finally uh, some of our friends had an intervention and, and kind of coerced him to go to a rehab center across the country like 5,000 kilometers away I don't know, 3,000 some odd miles and he flew out there very apprehensively feeling like we were kind of forcing him into it and it was borderline where he had agreed to it but now he was feeling forced and he almost snuck away but he went there two weeks into it somehow reading his bible just the the spirit of god came over him and the gospel finally clicked and it made sense and he knew immediately i'm free from this you know but he was he was scheduled to stay there at least three months and it was so hard for him to stay there because he knew i'm never going back and uh, we just didn't believe him you know he said all these things so many times before right so i'm sure there must have been some apprehension from people who knew you well to say yeah adam we've seen this before this probably is just jailhouse religion Mm -hmm. It was. And that's I was really thankful because I, I suppose that I'd listened to all these other stories about people getting saved in jail and they basically open the front doors and let you out and everything's OK. It didn't work like that <laughs> for me. <laughs> I had to stay another five months. Okay. Uh, but that was literally uh, the best. It was some of the best time of my life. I mean, I really felt like a whole person. In other words, the the high that I was always chasing, which is to just feel normal and feel comfortable in my own skin. I finally had that and didn't have to put it in my system. Uh, so I had to stay there for a few more months and we had you know, our group Bible study every morning and we had a church call two or three times a week. So uh, to be, to be jail all in all, it was still actually a pretty comfortable existence. Not so much you want to stay, but where they do take care of you pretty well. Yeah. I, I was in Tennessee on two occasions with uh, Tremaine. He did a lot of uh, preaching in prisons there at the time. And um, I came away from that saying that some of the freest people are the ones in captivity because there was some real good brothers in there. And I think from what I could gather, they were there for a long time. Like some of them were lifers kind of thing, right? 
and uh, they just really loved the Lord and they loved their Bible and they were reading and praying and listening and it, it was pretty neat to see that someone could be so captive and yet so free in their spirit, right? Right. So you're there for about six months roughly? Yes, yes. And when I was released, um, I was, it was strongly recommended, let's put it that way, from the state of Tennessee that I attend recovery meetings. I had to, they actually wanted me to do 90 meetings in 90 days. The whole problem was I live in Lobeville. Uh, I didn't know there was any meetings at all. I couldn't drive because I had lost my license, didn't have a car. I had pawned the car. And my grandmother is in her 80s. She can't drive me two cities away to go to a meeting. But again, Mr. Norman, uh, had a, he allowed me to go to church, and that would count as a meeting. And he told me that they had just recently started a recovery meeting here in Loboville. So I started okay. attending that immediately. And so we had, at this time, it was a Friday night meeting and a Wednesday night Bible study. So I went to both of those and I went to, I, I had friends that were Seventh-day Adventists. I went with went with them on Saturday to church, and then I would go to the Baptist church on Sunday, and I was just anywhere that there was something to do, I was there. I see. And then and then reading your Bible now in spare time, eh? Well, I, we had a habit in jail. We would get up and have breakfast at, at 6 o'clock, and then after breakfast, we would sit, and we had our group Bible study, sometimes to... 11 or 12 o'clock because we didn't have anything else to do that's what we did most of the day so i kept that habit i still have that habit which is when i get up in the morning whether it's 5 5 30 i come and i drink my tea and sit here and study and do that still every day and kind of that's how i start my day and it seems like it uh, kind of changes the trajectory of what i'm going to be doing kind of gets my mind focused i see um, maybe this is an odd question and, and you can totally say I'd rather not talk about that, but obviously one of the significant things about you when you're using your hand motions, we can all see that there's something wrong with your hand. Do you mind um, sharing that story or is that before? That is before jail, right? Yes, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I've gotten so I've gotten so used to that. I don't think about it anymore until I until somebody brings it up. Uh, but being an IV drug user, um, I have I have a lot of scars all over my body from from needles and from uh, different where you're missing with the, the shots. And on um, one particular evening, I I hit an artery in my right hand, and I immediately knew something was wrong because my thumb and my finger went numb. But you can't tell anybody. I couldn't tell my stepfather, who is a doctor. I just shot some drugs, and it's something's wrong. <laughs> So I hid it the best that I could hmm. and able to hide it for about eight days, eight days could hardly feel my hand. And finally, I started to have these severe flu like symptoms and I couldn't hardly get out of bed and it was starting to swell and get black. And I finally had to go tell him. I and see. He, he immediately took me to, to Nashville to uh, I think it was St. Thomas. And then after after arriving there, I remember I had to lay there for hours before we could get a surgeon to come in. And he asked me what had happened. And I told him this long story about oh, I caught it in the door or you know, something that sounded really good at the time. And he finally shooed everyone out of the room and he goes, Look, I cannot help you if you don't tell me the truth. So I told him what happened. I, you know, I injected some drugs here. So he said, Okay, well, we're we're gonna have to do surgery. And after he did the ultrasound and was looking around he said that i would he said it was possible that i lose my entire arm up to the elbow of course i'm, I'm terrified uh, but he said i would at least have to lose one finger okay so they they prepped me for surgery medicated me and i was still so addicted at this point i felt really happy that they were giving me narcotics it's, it's horrible just, this situation just what you needed eh? <laughs> Right. So I got, well, at least this is going good. Uh, so they, they took me back and they had to amputate. I don't know if I can show it on camera. I guess I can. Oh, yeah. The thumb and the forefinger. And the scars go all the way up to right in here where they oh, had man. to take out part of the, muscle, part of the tendon. Um, but they kept me very, very medicated in the hospital. And so that's just, it, it, you know, I'm really enjoying myself even after I've had this 
horrible trauma. And I remember the, I guess about the third day, they came in and said, do you want to see it? Like, sure. So they unwrapped it and it was, it was so surreal to see this permanent injury that's not going to go away. It's not really going to get any better. You can't, you can't hide from this. Uh, but again, I just kind of compartmentalized it and went on. And uh, that I went on to use drugs for another three or four years after that. Wow. So uh, that, just, that was uh, <laughs> like you were mid early 30s when this happened? Right. It would have been those early 30s. Okay. Yeah. Is that year? Sorry, say that again. I, I couldn't remember the exact year, but it was a few years before my mother died. Okay. I see, man. Um, that's quite a story. Your, is your uh, stepfather still involved in your life, or how did he deal with you? Was he uh, patient with you, or was he pretty tired of your in and out of jail and all that? Both, and of course, he had to take care of me financially. He took care of my kids financially. Uh, we had a lot of uh, well, due to all the legal stuff that went on, uh, I had a no contact order with him and not to go on his property that is still in effect i've still got another few six months or so on my sentence but that's still in effect i have wow. seen him a couple times at either a family function or i saw him at a funeral the other day he's never been uh since he knows that i've gotten saved and been out he hasn't shown any animosity towards me but there's just a there's a great gulf that's fixed <laughs> between the two of us that hasn't really bridged understandably so man that's rough so if we go back to your story now you're six months in jail you get saved there and you come out what's what's this like i mean you start attending church you go into seventh day adventist and baptist church and your your um overseer what's his name again uh jamie norman jamie my... norman is keeping you out of trouble and you know watching over you a little bit uh, what what transpires from there you get back into work and life and and are you are you just free of temptation for narcotics or is it uh, a struggle well the the temptation for narcotics that was gone and i'm so thankful that that was not a struggle because i had proven that i could not win in that struggle but right. that was but still the temptation for the pornography and the perversion was there and and i'll tell you this I had, of course, I had my phone when I had all these Bible apps on there and these devotional apps. And every week it gives you a readout of how much screen time you're, you're spending. And so I'm looking at and I've got version Bible, Blue Letter Bible, all these different things. And then I have Pornhub and these other porn sites. And I'm sitting just looking at this. And that was the first time I thought, you know, this might actually be a problem that I'm dividing up my time between <laughs> pornography scriptures unbelievable uh, god is so gracious when we first get saved eh? where he deals with you where you're at recognizing that you know everybody starts at a different place but man oh man such grievous sin right alongside your bible that's incredible but seeing it right there really brought it to the forefront where again where i couldn't uh, couldn't get away from it but i did start working but now i'm well i don't have a driver's license i'm in an extremely small town I'm missing most of my right hand and I'm a felon. So all of these things make it very difficult to find some work, but I was right. very to find just some odd jobs, maybe mowing a yard, uh, carrying firewood, albeit a little lopsided, but I'd still carry it. Just anything that I could find where I was able to start paying on, on this mountain of fines and restitution. So you had uh, things that to back pay still at this point. Yes, and actually to this day, I still have things that I'm paying on. Um, part of it's restitution, then they have fines and fees that go with that. There's monthly monitoring fees that go with the probation system. So there's all sorts of things that you that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the deal that you take. Yes, I'll be on probation and I'll pay whatever you want me to pay. You just let me out of here. <laughs> so you do that and then you kind of saddled with debt for the next few years. I see. <laughs> Well, um, the, the central theme that I like to focus on that I, I know you love to speak of now too, is the cross, the gospel. And obviously when you're in jail, you understood enough of who God was, his mercy and his grace to feel like he's accepting of you. 
Was there a point now as you were growing and as you were studying where the cross started to really stand out to you, where you realized this is the crux, you know, this is the point. I realized very early on, and this was, uh, I'll tell you this other part, I guess, when I get to it, but I realized very early on that I had a choice of whether or not I was going to believe God or believe myself, my own experience and my own thoughts. It's one thing to know that you're forgiven, to believe that you're forgiven, but then when the old, old thoughts creep in or that, that condemnation, that guilt and regret, and you want to regress and move back to that, and it's almost like you believe and trust God all over again. Not like not that you get saved again, but it's like mm-hmm. you have those unique opportunities every day to believe Him or to believe myself. And I remember that so well. That was the first time it happened was when I was in jail, and I was thinking about all those things like stealing my daughter's piggy bank, robbing from my family members. And that was the first scripture that I memorized was, like we said earlier, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I would just quote it to myself over and over again to remind myself that this is my reality. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what I think. This Mm -hmm. is my reality. And I I think that's probably why most people stayed away from me because I'm walking around, I'm quoting <laughs> scripture under my breath. They probably didn't want to, you know, talk to me too much after that. That's awesome. How would you, how well would you fit in then with the Seventh Day Adventists and some of these other groups where go- the gospel really isn't that central in some of those places, eh? Right. I'm actually, still being friends with some of them, they're actually some of the nicest and sweetest people that I've ever met. Um, and but coming from the United Pentecostal background, the very strict dress and the no makeup on the ladies and the hair having to be a certain way, that's that's what I grew up with, albeit a little bit different. So it wasn't so unusual for me to, to see legalism in all its life. So I kind of was accustomed to it. Right. What uh, what did you end up doing in the next couple of years then? Because this this would be when you were released from jail, if I'm remembering correctly or piecing your story together correctly. It's only in the last four or five years. Right. Yes. Coming up, uh, this May will be five years. Okay. Five years. I've been saved, and since I've been sober, because those both happened right at the same time. Uh, so I, for the next year or two, I, I was working just odd jobs. That's all I could find, any and everything. I had a friend who is actually not a believer to this day, but he's one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. He's an older man that's a a veteran. He's from New Jersey, so he's very unique on every front. And he actually took me under his wing uh, doing some work for him. He's disabled. He can't do a lot of work. I'm disabled too, but so it was both of us working together. Uh, And he actually just gave me a lot of work. I was able to pay off... uh, quite a bit of my fines and fees and get back on my feet some, which would have been extremely difficult if not for him. Uh, uh, He actually found a car, bought it, and told me that I could drive it until I paid for it. And then when it came time to get, he drove me to get my license. And, uh, you know, God really, really used that man. And I told him, I told him that and he got angry, you know, since he's not a believer. But I said, hey, even though you're not a believer, God is still using you. Uh, Why are you giving God work. the credit for something that I did, right? Yeah. That's a, yeah. I see. Uh, but you know, doing all those odd jobs, that's that was really just my life, going to, going to these recovery meetings, going to church. And I eventually stopped going to the seventh-day adventist church because if you if you study enough and you hear enough then you just you can't turn a blind eye to things that are just not right i mean everybody's got their own peculiar doctrines and things but there was just too much there to ignore so i so i finally stopped going there yeah it's it's more the uh, the central themes of the bible the the um the close-handed type of issues, right? I often put it that way. I heard it from a preacher years ago that there's close-handed issues, there's open-handed issues. You know, you can fit all kinds of stuff in here as dress code or um, a mode of life and living or views of end times, perhaps even or views of creation and whatnot. But the close-handed stuff is we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And it's uh, God became a man. You know, Jesus is fully God. Uh, he was born of a virgin. These things are, they're kind of, 
if if the church isn't teaching those things, then are they really truly the church? Because those are the things that make you a Christian, right? Believing who God says he is, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that kind of thing. So, you know, we can we can be pretty open with some of those open-handed issues, but when a church is not teaching these things, or at least uh, not really focused on them, it starts to feel like it's not a place where you can really find proper help and fellowship, right? We had the very last time I was at a Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, and I really did like the way that they had their services because people would ask questions during the service, and it was very open, the discussion. And I remember this one gentleman saying that, and he called everyone else Gentiles. I didn't know how weird that was at the time, but he said uh, people think that they can be righteous apart from the law, and that's just not true. And you know, I heard that and I thought, wait a minute, if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. <laughs> and I didn't even, I just heard that. So there's this major contradiction. And so that was the last time that I was there. Okay. <laughs> I just thought that that was. I see. Well, there's an awful lot of options uh, down in Tennessee as far as church goes. So where did you end up finding your place where you could settle in a little more? Well, our recovery group is at First Baptist Church here in Loboville. And so I got to know the people there very well. Plus, I'm there twice a week for recovery meetings. So that is where, and that's where I teach at today. So I, I really just got to know the people there very well. And I don't agree with everything there either. But it's like, just like you said, the closed hand and the open hand, there are things that even though you don't agree with 100%, they're not salvation issues or things mm -hmm. that you can't get past. Okay, so you're teaching there regularly. I think I saw a video of you standing in a pulpit or behind a pulpit preaching. Yes, uh, I, I teach a Sunday school there, and then occasionally I'll I'll preach if we have. Uh, mostly, it was on Sunday night is when I used to preach it. But some every once in a while, I'll do something on Sunday morning, and okay. it really stand up in front of a church of what is mostly an older congregation, and I actually I'll stand up front and I preach the message about pornography Sunday morning and I'm looking out over the crowd and say this isn't something that I read about this is what I lived mm -hmm. this is what I did. Uh, but God has given me uh, for somebody that's not really that bold he's given me a lot of boldness to talk about the darkness of where I've been because I know that wherever I'm at no matter what the crowd looks like somebody else is still enslaved in it right then yeah especially with pornography because it's so easily hidden and it's so easily accessible anymore. You know, you don't have to uh, walk around feeling like you're ashamed of who you are because you're looking at this stuff because almost everybody is. There's stats out there that would put in, you know, 90 plus percent of men that are looking at it routinely or fairly regularly. And, and I don't doubt that, that that's a pretty accurate uh, statistic, right? So even, even older men, 50, 60, 70 years old, they're still perverted, they're still flesh, and they have their struggles, right? And I, I find that the, the mention of boldness, I really appreciate that, because uh, when the early disciples were looking for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, they asked God to give them boldness to preach the gospel, to preach the resurrection, right? Because that was that what they were being threatened by was stop preaching in this name. And they prayed for boldness, and God, you know, baptized them again with the Holy Spirit. So... That is something that comes along with salvation is that boldness. Right. And this is what led you to doing the, uh, these videos in the studio. Uh, you, have, you have your title, the man of God at large. Where did this come from? Uh, my office manager and I, we were on a, a business trip down to Louisiana where it was a chaplain's convention. And I, w I had been talking to my wife back and forth over the phone. And she told me that I ought to get some business cards made up where maybe I had a QR code or something that went to uh, the good and evil or, or something. And so I was just thinking what would be a really cool business card that would look professional, but look unique. But if I had an acronym on there that that would be great. And I thought mogul would be a great acronym. And so then I put the words together, what it meant. And it was, you know, man of God at large. And, and there's nothing real mystic or intelligent behind it other than I just thought it sounded really yeah, entertaining. It's a, it's a catchy phrase for sure. So, I mean, you just said a couple things there that obviously we have to touch on. You said you spoke to your wife. Uh, you, you've been married now, and I think it's only in the last year or two. Yes, and just because I forget these things, it doesn't mean that they're not important to me. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, yeah, I've been married uh, this, this, the end of this year, September 4th, that'll be two years. So really it's about a year and a half at yep. this point. Okay. The first time I married, um, and now of course I have children and she has children from a previous marriage, but this is the first marriage that I've ever had. This is the first home that I've ever had. That's actually ours. Uh, wow. So it's a completely new life. It's like being dropped off in a whole nother country, another planet. And given the keys to a car, I said, there you go, it's yours. <laughs> Unbelievable. To be in a covenant with another person, to have that responsibility now, uh, when only four or five years ago, you know, you were in a dark, pretty dark place six years ago, right? That's mm -hmm. incredible. Where where did you meet her? Was it at church? Actually, her mother and I, when we are, I know everybody is not really friends with their mother-in-law, but my mother-in-law and I are really good friends. Uh, she and her husband had started the recovery meeting there for people in recovery. They're not in recovery, but they just wanted to help people. So in the process of being friends with them, we went to a lot of different functions, uh, parades or whatever that had to be going on. And we had a Christmas parade. This is, I've been out of jail for maybe three months at this point, two, three months. And my mother-in-law, which her name is Sarah, she couldn't pick me up. I couldn't drive there because I don't have a license. So she said, well, I'll have my daughter come and pick you up. And so she did. And so I got to meet her and talk to her. And we did not get along. We did not hit it off. <laughs> There's not music or stars. We just didn't really like each other. But we did establish a little bit of a rapport where we would talk to each other. And she would message me occasionally if she knew somebody that was looking for help, looking for treatment. And we would talk about that. And that kind of and we even did a couple of jobs together. She has her own cleaning business and of course I'm unemployed so I did work with her some but still it was all just very we're friends or associates until about two or three years in interesting something <laughs> sparked eh yes finally I would imagine from pretty early on you were were wishful thinking hoping that maybe there'd be a chance or what uh actually I was pretty dead set on not getting in a relationship that's one of the worst pitfalls that people in recovery get into okay. uh, they actually they tell you in most recovery groups not to get into a relationship the first year and I think it's a really good idea really because you lose focus of what you're doing and working on yourself and you immediately throw yourself into another situation and there's the you know, opinions vary but numbers don't lie and it's statistically devastating for most people in recovery so I was dead set that I was not going to get in a relationship and uh, managed to hold to that actually till three years in. Very interesting. And uh, eventually uh, things s s took off and you got married and uh, now you're attending this Baptist church together. And um, you also mentioned good and evil. That was the other thing I heard you mention in that one statement there where you mentioned your wife and good and evil. So there's obviously a connection now to no greater joy and uh, Michael Pearl, perhaps I, this is where I first saw you, right? Right. Well, that's how I first heard of Mike is being in jail. And I saw a copy of Good and Evil there. And so I remember the name. We actually had one of his cousins that preaches there at Perry County Jail. And so I asked, are you related to him? He said, well, we're cousins. We thought maybe it was his brother. And so I hung on to the name. And then when I was released and I've got a phone now in between looking at pornography, mind you, I'm uh, listening to these different pastors on YouTube and listening to all these different things. And I remembered that name. So I looked up Michael Pearl and I, I forgot to mention this too. My mother-in-law is actually his sister, which I never, I didn't know until a couple of years in, but so I'm sending her my, my new best friend. I'm sending her all these videos of Mike that I think <laughs> are just astounding. And she never told me that was her brother. So that was just a, an inside joke that I didn't find out about till later. Interesting. Uh, but that was, that was my uh, exposure to my, that I just remembered that name and started watching his YouTube videos and which probably I'd say almost certainly led to, you know, me starting to make videos myself because after seeing some of his. Yeah. And you knew when in jail already, you probably must've seen that he was uh, pretty local to where you guys are from. Eh? I really didn't know that until I was released. I, it wasn't it wasn't really common knowledge that he was, you know, from the, you know, this, the neighboring county, or at least it wasn't with the group that I was with there. Okay. So now I believe you work for No Greater Joy? I do. 
um, after the odd jobs that I kept kept working, uh, my first job was at a treatment center, which is in the next county over. I worked, um, I answered the phones, and that was a, a pretty good job for me. It was the first steady job that I actually worked. And so after being there about a year and a half, uh, Debbie Pearl, who I'd met and met at the door several times, I used to go when they were filming on Thursday nights, she had messaged me and said they were going to have a position that was available or would be available. And she wanted to know if I was interested. And it was basically the same things that I was doing at the treatment center, which is answering the phone, doing data entry, all of those uh, sort of just office work. Only the difference is it would be in ministry and working in ministry and helping to facilitate the spread of the gospel. So needless to say, I jumped on the opportunity and, you know, to be there and to be just right in the middle of things. And if you see people on YouTube or you see them on TV, you kind of build this uh, image up in your mind. It's almost uh, they're, you're starstruck. Or they're, uh, but then Mike comes in driving a side by side and he's got mud and dirt all over him. And he was not a celebrity when he walked in. And that's what <laughs> that's what everyone is so drawn to about him. That he's. He's he's an every man, just like every everyone else. Yeah, act as though better than someone. Yeah, I remember meeting him on the very first occasion because he had had so much influence on my life. I, it was one of those things where I, I just felt awkward and uncomfortable, didn't know what to say, and you could tell because I said to him that his ministry had had a huge impact on me. He was just like, okay, whatever, man. Like he, he just kind of <laughs> shrugged it off, and it, it made me feel really weird too because I'm like. Now, what am I doing? I know he's just a normal guy. I just treat him like a normal guy, right? But anyway, he took me up on his side by side. This is when he was building his house and all that. So it was a pretty neat experience, but definitely it felt a little strange. So it, it's a, a weird world that we live in. It, in a way, you know, technology has made life a lot easier and simpler. And this whole video, you know, you and I, uh, hours and hours away from each other, now having a, a live chat like this is, is very neat. And the fact that I can put out a video and 500, 600, 1,000 people maybe watch it, or at least parts of it, is uh, it's a very different way of approaching things. And there's benefits to it for sure. But at the same time, it does give you this mindset or this uh, idea that the person that's recording the video is so far superior. They, they've got everything put together or they're uh, of a different type of person, right? Where... You meet, you meet me and you see all my faults and my shortcomings pretty quick. You know, you spend some time around my farm or my issues or my, my life that we have here and you'll see plenty of shortcomings, right? So it, it, can, uh, it can definitely be misread or misunderstood sometimes because all you're seeing is the things I want you to see, right? Right. I remember meeting Mike and Debbie for the first time and that's when I was going there to the door. And he would go around and meet new people that were there. And my mother-in-law was there with me. And she said, he's from the recovery group. And it was almost like his demeanor changed when he heard I was from the recovery group. He was, hey, how's it going? And, you know, and he sat there and talked with me, was interested, genuinely interested, uh, because he and Debbie both have that sort of a mindset and a heart mm -hmm. for, for people, people that need help. And if you're super religious and you don't need any help and you're already holy, I mean, he really don't want to talk to you. But if you're somebody that really needs help, uh, they're, you know, they're extending a hand of, of fellowship to you. So that really stuck with me, making it made a real impression yeah. on me. And, you know, I, I hope to, like that sort of thing in the future to be that exactly. open with people. that need. Maybe, maybe we could go there to kind of finish off the video. How would you recommend if someone is dealing with someone who's in drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pornography addiction, and they can see that their friend or their family member or their spouse or whatever is drowning in it. Um, what If you can't be an enabler, if that's the wrong approach, how do you approach someone that's struggling with such a deep, um, all-encompassing you know, sin that's so captivating like that? Uh, really two things, and both of them are extremely hard. And one is to not rush in to try to rescue, which is pay bills, uh, step in front of the trouble or make phone calls for it to. I'm sorry, they can't come into work today. They're sick. Uh, and that's that's really the worst kind of enabling, which is, um, you know, taking care of someone's problems for it. And it's really hard to watch somebody close to you suffer the consequences of their own actions. But it, if you want to help someone, that's what you have to do. 
there's a phrase called tough love that I don't like because it implies that there's two types of love. That is love, period, to mm. let people for those consequences, because it's ultimately what's going to make you look out for something better. And the second part, and this is where people really find this offensive, which is you probably need to get help yourself. If you are in a family with someone that is addicted, especially like on these hard drugs that we've been talking about, and you've lived in that life for years, then you have problems too. It's not that you're going to need detox or anything, but those mental problems and that uh, the drama and everything that goes with it, it, it leaves a scar on you as well. And so you really, you do the same thing that people in recovery do. You find other like-minded people that are willing to help you, hold you accountable when you make changes and, you know, avail yourself of that, even though you're not the one with the problem, uh, you need, you need help too. Okay. So that's, uh, one is don't rush into help. Don't always try to fix their problems for them. Two is uh, get some help for yourself. Is there anything yeah. that you can actually offer the person to say, look, there's, there's a way out of this? Or is it just extreme amount of patience and prayer? Because obviously you got saved sitting there just praying. Maybe it was people in your surroundings praying for you that God would come through in some miraculous way, right? Yeah, I don't think, you know, God makes us all as individuals. I mean, I, there's no cookie cutter that he makes us all the same and he reaches people in different ways. So there's not one a one size fits all that works for people. Uh, but those two that I mentioned are a good standard to, to keep. But sometimes it's you know people get saved in rehab or they'll get saved during the church meeting or they you know, may get sober in um uh, in jail, you know, like I was, but it's, it's a little different for everyone. But huh, Mike has this phrase that what you need is you need a pill. You need the gospel because it works hundred percent of the time. And it's, it sounds so it's almost kind of corny, but it's hundred percent true Absolutely. is that's the, it's, it's the cure all for everything, whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, religion. theft, whatever. Right. And use religion. It's the, it's the pill for that. that fixes it. And so you just keep administering that cure. And if not, you at least let people know that it's available. So that's where it would very much make sense. Say, you know, you're struggling with someone like that. Make sure that you yourself get the gospel and get healthy and get clear mm -hmm. and get rejoicing so that it can have some kind of an effect. Right. And so that you can do that so-called tough love, which is true, just true, genuine love. Right. You put out a little video right. the other day that I, I really appreciated. My brother actually sent it he lives in alberta so he lives three thousand kilometers some odd kilometers away and uh, he sent he shared that video as well on his facebook page i believe it was and maybe he sent it to me directly but he said basically you were saying that uh, by the way you respond to people you're training them in a sense right you're you're teaching them how they should act to you towards you in the future so this would very much be the case if you're allowing an addict uh, to kind of govern your life you're you're allowing them or you're teaching them how they should respond and react to you so you pay their bills when they they don't make their payments you lie for them when they don't show up to work and stuff you're teaching them what they are allowed to do and how far they can go and then eventually you make allowances for them to take advantage of you and steal from you and what else, whatever else right right yes yeah, it's, it's a lot like child training really just the circumstances are different but the same principles are there apply Absolutely. Anyway, there's uh, you've got several um, social media platforms that you're involved with now. I think probably your big one is TikTok. Uh, for the door or for myself? Or... Uh, for your personal man of God at large. Oh, yeah. Mostly it's uh, it's TikTok and, and YouTube is where I'm active most of the time. And, and of course, and then on Facebook as well. But that's sort of becoming the, the way of the dinosaur to be on Facebook. That's what I keep being told. But that's where I'm, you know, I would post that most of the time. Okay. I've heard that too, but when I post a video to YouTube and Facebook on the same, the same video, the Facebook one will tend to get a few more views than, than YouTube, but I don't know for sure how they count the views, right? Sometimes you just skip past the video. Maybe that's already counted as a view. It's hard to tell, right? So, but anyway, I appreciate what you're doing and I hope you continue on. Is there anything else that you had really wanted to uh, to either promote or talk about or something that you wanted to cover before we close the conversation? Uh, well, 
Well, of course, I would like to put in a plug for No Greater Joy Ministries and The Door, because not just because I work there and we're going to get some more clicks and more likes, but it is literally changing lives and reaching the world. And I have never been around a group of people that are so dedicated to helping, quote unquote, disfranchise myself. Uh, they go above and beyond to help people that are not just in prison, but recovery groups and rehab centers. And, you know, we've, we've been talking about how everyone needs the gospel and it's an excellent way to get it to them. But using something like good and evil for someone that is so hardened to hearing the gospel, they'll pick up a comic book and they'll read that. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it. And then above and beyond the comic book, they've got the website now where, you know, all across the Middle East, a lot of Muslims are, are pick, clicking on to the, the website and all that too, right? So it's an incredible ministry. It's uh, definitely been very monumental in our lives, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, appreciate uh, hearing from you and uh, learning a little more about you. I think this will be a real blessing to people that are tuning in, so... Well, thank you, Dan. It's a, it's a privilege. What's your wife's name, if you don't mind me asking? I didn't ask on the video. Right. Uh, it's Anna. Okay. Anna. But she's a very, uh, she's actually quite the opposite for me. She's not real talkative. She's not super outgoing and exuberant. Uh, she's a very steady, very kind, very, uh, very loving woman. And it's, even though we, we butt heads because we're so different personality wise, I mean, she's exactly what I need. Uh, it's I, I couldn't if you gave me a laundry list I probably wouldn't come up with that but it's exactly what I mean. <laughs> what a joy man to see that you, you know you you ran your life down to the point where it seemed like it wasn't worth living and you know messing everyone's life around you up and to the point where now you're not only out of jail and out of the drugs and all that but God has blessed you with a wife and with a future and with ministry and purpose and all that it's uh, God is definitely gracious Yes, absolutely. And I didn't expect any of it. I mean, well, I mean, you know what it's like when you when you get saved, you're like, even if nothing else happens, this is a miracle within itself. Yeah. And just keep saying, here, have some more here, have some more. Hey, would you yeah. like some more? It's just it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. I remember when I first got saved, there was a story and I forget where this was from. It must have been in some era and some time when uh, Christians or people were really, really suffering. I forget how it went, but there was a man who was saved and rejoicing and somebody gave him a, a piece of dry bread and some water and he looked at it and he said, all this and Jesus too? Like he just couldn't believe how blessed he was, right? The, that, you know, we've got Christ, what more could you want? But on top of that, I've got a wife who is supremely dedicated to me and I'm, I, you know, on Instagram, she has her title, her label is Dan's lady, you know, a person in this world <clears throat> proudly says, I'm that guy's lady, like unbelievable how gracious God can be, right? Mm -hmm. And then to have seven kids on top of that, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, something to be humbled and thankful for. Yeah, I can't, you know, I, and I complain and I, I get in my head and start thinking, well, things aren't what I want them to be. And I, you know, so, um, uh, uh, just unrealistic with my thinking sometimes and I, I miss the magnanimity of it that I'm I'm living I'm living in yesterday's prayers the impossible prayers and this is this is now my reality in my life it's it's unreal if you just kind of stop and look around and say I, I just can't believe I'm here mm -hmm. uh, it's just really amazing awesome Right on. Well, I won't take up any more of your time. I really do appreciate you spending time with me away from your wife and all that. So, Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.